that like the essence of transness is that we don't live in a binary world. Mm-hmm. You know, like the essence of transness is fluidity of thought, is liminal space. It, it is the capacity to change our minds. It is the capacity to to transform, to change ourselves, um, to 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 like evolve new ways of thinking and new ways of being. So like a, we can't apply black and white ways of thinking, but also like to you know love and respect the multiplicity that exists in in human beings, and that we're all fucking human beings. Hello, I am Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there and the people that they used to know. My guest on this week's show is Simona Castricum, a musician, DJ and producer based in Melbourne. And we caught up to talk about Hugs and Kisses, a night that ran in the 2010s and took advantage of the looser licensing laws, shall we say, that applied to the venue that it was based in. And this created a wonderful hedonistic atmosphere reminiscent of the early rave scene. We talked a lot about being safe on the scene and how to create a safe culture, becoming yourself and drinking in the street, because why not? Oh, and I need to let you know that Simona is probably the most Australian person that I have ever spoken to and uses a whole heap of colloquial language. So you may want to familiarise yourself with the terms cooked, hoon, sick, goon and pingers before you listen to the episode. But, you know, then again, it's kind of fun guessing as you go along, so I'll, I'll leave that decision up to you. Yeah, well, I think when I finally moved to Melbourne, I was kind of like, okay, like I'm going to really lean into my transness. But I didn't really have the language at the time, to be perfectly honest. You know, it was the 90s. And so like all of the language that we have to understand gender identity and gender nonconformity, you know, is completely different. Like back then it's it was, yeah, you know, like I said, um, yeah, I went through conversion therapy in um, in 94. Four. Oh wow! Um, so that took a while for me to unpack. <laughs> it took a while. Was that because your parents wanted that for you, or uh, yeah, yeah? I just sort of ended up there through my child psychologist, um, oh, which was um, sort of you know, um, so um, was sort of like sent there in my sort of you know late teens, and um, yeah, I ended up on the on the wrong side of of that, and um, yeah, ended up with the DSM weaponized against me, um, which is what they do. And um, so I was basically given the wrong language and the wrong diagnosis to understand myself, which meant that when I, you know, finally came, you know, sort of like, you know, four or five years later to wanting to figure that stuff out, I I just didn't really, um, didn't really know how to actually do that, but I was still, it didn't stop me from, from trying, um, you know, so it was just, for me, it was just like a whole series of times where I was trying to come out, but because it was just so dangerous, I ended up having to go back in, but at least like for this time, you know, like I was, you know, presenting as genderqueer and, you know, sort of like moving, you know, about my life as, you know, pretty Mm. much as, um, as genderqueer or gender nonconforming, you know, I, I just stopped caring about, what people really thought of me in that sense. And so I just really sort of made those spaces as safe as I possibly could, but um, it was still pretty frightening. We were talking like 98, 99. I was pretty, yeah. pretty scary to walk the streets. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and you say that you stopped caring uh, about what people said about you and then, and then took up that extra space, but that's easier on some days than it is on others. Correct. How did you like maintain that kind of energy or maintain that spirit? 
Yeah, yeah, you know, like one of my favourite songs is um, Laura Branigan's "Self Control" because it's sort of like the video and the song kind of tells this story of, um, you know, oh, the night is my world, you know, city light painted girls in the day, nothing matters. It's the night time that flatters. And you're not you're not going to sing that for us, are you? Oh. Why, why why did you not sing that? <laughs> I. I live among <laughs> the creatures of the night. Oh, I thought, oh, I thought you were going to say no. There you go. <laughs> so I, was, I considered myself a creature of the night. And uh-huh. so by the time basically it got to knock off time on Thursday afternoon from uni or whatever I was doing, it was sort of like, right, let's get some pre-drinks happening. Let's get dressed up. Let's put on some makeup. Let's put on a thing and um, let's let's do this for the next four days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really immersed, I guess, in this world where, you know, I'd I'd found like a pretty small community, but still back in those days, like gender nonconformity, it it still wasn't safe. Like even a venue like Q&A, for instance, like it's it's still like I would be, you know, queuing up in the line or I would be in there and I would have like, I'd be getting hassled by TERFs. I'd be getting hassled by like radical lesbians, like, yeah, you know, like causing harm, causing like serious harm, like assaulting me, like verbally, verbaling me, like all of this stuff. Um, so growing up in the 90s was incredibly difficult, particularly for trans women, because we just weren't welcome in um, dyke spaces. Absolutely not. Like we were considered you know, just like really poor impersonations of femininity. We were considered, you know, like a, an affront to the rights of women, um, you know, all of the things. So, you know, those anxieties get taken out on us in queer space, in dyke space, in gay space, in, in you know, a whole lot of spaces. Like it wasn't safe to be trans in gay and lesbian spaces in the 90s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so here I am trying to come out and those those problems presented very acutely for me through that time, so much so that I ended up going back into the closet, so to speak, because it just wasn't safe. Oh, gosh. That's a really tricky minefield, isn't it? Like the compromise that you have to make either way. Yeah, everything's coming at you from every angle and you think that you've found, you know, the little spot on the horizon where you feel as if you're going to be accepted and you've you're just excluded and um yeah and when things happen to you no one's there no one's listening to you and no one's going to believe you so when stuff was happening to me no one no one was there to believe me so I was sort of like out of my own a little bit and I sort of had to go back to presenting as masculine and trying to fake it again (laughs) how long did you do that oh I did that for another another 12 years ah okay Wow. But 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 um you know but everyone that knew me closely knew that you know knew of my femininity you know and I was pretty upfront with people that were close to me but I kept it pretty pretty uh, like under wraps you know at the same time so it's just a rough time <laughs> you know coming out is is a you know and being out is is it's it's definitely a risk but it's 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 also on the other side of that it's somewhat of a privilege too because um you know there's a lot of people that just don't have the capacity to be out yeah and because of the dangers that being out presents uh there's, there's just so much to lose and you know for trans people it's and and also for for gay and lesbian and bi people, it was always our safety, our personal safety. Mm-hmm. Um, but there just wasn't the critical mass in Melbourne at that time for me to be able to, you know, have that sense of safety, to have that sense of belonging. And certainly, like the trans rights movement wasn't anywhere close yes, to where yeah. it is now. So this sense that any rights that I could have been afforded were going to be permanent, mm. you know, just seemed like a, a out there idea. So that's why it wasn't until sort of cusp of the 2010s that all of a sudden the sort of social and political conditions existed where perhaps I had an opportunity to, you know, finally, um, you know, realise myself for myself. But uh, otherwise I was just living in hiding for my own safety. Yeah, but like shit, performing your gender for 12 years in that way, that must have been exhausting. 
More performing my gender for 37 years. Well, okay, yeah. Yeah. But but after having had that experience of coming out, as it were, because I can't think of a better term, and being yourself and then having to pull back a bit on that, that must have been horrible. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, trans transition isn't a linear process for, you know, I, I think that's the, the thing, for, that's the experience, particularly, I think, for... For middle-aged and and older trans people, like you know, um, transition is you know has a has a very different temporality to it. Mm-hmm. To that, I think of you know millennials or or Gen Z. That it, yeah, we, we just have to sort of. I've had to, I've had to go in and out of hiding, but but through that, I kind of I formulated my own tactics of survival. I formulated my own tactics of how to find. Community. I formulated my own tactics of, I guess, how to build a cognitive map of of a trans city as well, of my own trans city, and but also that that that's, that time that you're spending thinking and dreaming of a better world has informed my music, has informed my architecture, does inform my creative practice. It also informs, I guess, like my own political ideas as well, and how they're deeply embedded in my creative methodologies. So um, there's still gold amongst this, but. Yeah, 37 was a late age to finally, you know, get to to do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is annoying mm-hmm. um, because there's a lot of time lost. But, you know, I've also got some great things as well, you know, so. Yeah, and everyone, yeah, everyone's journey is their own journey. I mean, I'm not, no, I'm not trying to be a little, like toxic positivity about it, but, you know, like <laughs> there's, 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 most of it's trauma, but I'm not, I'm not going to ta- turn it into Simona's trauma corner. <laughs> oh, Simona, oh, you've, you've said that before, haven't you? You knew that it rhymed. No, I, I haven't, but I am a songwriter, so it's not, it's not unusual that, that rhyming shit's going to come out of my mouth, but, um, you know. Simona's Trauma Corner. I'm like, you could have a kids' TV show called that. No, um, <laughs> no, no, just, no, 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 no. Not, no. Actually, a very good friend of mine wants uh, wants me to have a, a my own YouTube or my own podcast that is um called In the Nineties with Simona. <laughs> <laughs> is that an oft used phrase? Oh, uh, lots of lots of my sentences start with In the Nineties or In the Eighties, <laughs> and um and everyone just goes, everyone just sort of like sinks back in their chair and goes, Glazes oh, over. Go. Yeah. Simona's. Uh, on on one. <laughs> um, so then you, uh, you, I don't know how to say this without sounding like an idiot. Sorry, but like you came oh, back to your trans. We're having a conversation here. <laughs> you know, if there's any, know. if anyone out there wants to cancel you for sounding like an idiot, I said to someone the other day, like if you haven't been cancelled, are you even living? <laughs> No, it's. I'm not worried about being cancelled. I'm just worried about sounding like I'm <laughs> being overly like poetic or like trying like flower up. Oh my come on, no, but, come on, look, we can we can sound please, we can be poetic <laughs> and we lie. Come on, like just lay on the cheese, lay on the cheese. <laughs> Okay, so when you jumped back on the unicorn of your transness and galloped into the evening, oh god, yeah. See, I can't do this. Oh, I but love like, this. No, I love this for <laughs> us. This is so gay. Yeah. So you started. Uh, you you went you oh, you went back. What am I? St- yeah. So in the early 2010s, and one of the clubs that you went to. Oh, see, I'm bringing it. I'm bringing it to the subject of today's episode. Is hugs and kisses. Hugs. Long live hugs. Oh, so so if I was in the know and I was cool, I'd call it hugs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It'd be like, are you going to hugs tonight? Okay. So from here on out, that's what I'm going to call it, hugs. Um, do you remember like the first time you ever went there? Yeah. So I f- first went to uh, hugs and kisses when it was called the Buffalo Club, and and it's, and it sort of wasn't really that that different, except the lighting was different. Um, it was a bit of a mix of live bands and club, but it was it was still a bit of a free for all. It was sort of like on one of these twenty four hour liquor licenses because it was an RSL, and I don't you know oh, for, and, for, for, yeah, no one's going to know what for that people means. outside of um, <laughs> Australia. Like a, a, the RSL is the Return Services League, which is. Um, you know, basically like a place where re- retired soldiers go and, you know, drink beer and hang out. Um, but there was a sort of license, which was like an RSL license. But this was a 
basically a club of ex- it used to be the Royal Antediluvian Order <gasps> of Buffaloes. It was I a men's club. I fucking love that name. I fucking love that I know, name. I know, right? Way. And I had to look up Antediluvian. Antediluvian, and it means before the biblical flood. Like what the hell? Like what the hell? <laughs> yeah, so it's some it's some cooked shit, basically. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but, but so basically, and the top floor was was where they had. Um, it was sort of like a little bit of a ballroom, I guess. And this was sort of in the 50s, you know, that was sort of their heyday. And and essentially like it it was just part of old Melbourne CBD that was just really derelict. And so like, you know, in 2010, like it became the Buffalo Club. And so like the first time I went there, I went and saw um, Melbourne band Hate Rock, who are like one of my favourite bands. And um, it was it was the first time I was started to come out again. So this was would have been I guess like two hundred oh, sorry two thousand and twelve. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I, I kind of like went in there and I was really really nervous because it was a pretty like cishet Melbourne cool kind of crowd. And you know I was I sort of like cut my teeth in the in the rubber and the fetish seen in Melbourne in the in the in the 20 in the in the 2000s um so I was like really into I guess like leather and rubber and all that sort of stuff and and so I sort of like you know rocked up you know in that kind of vibe and you know I'm a bit tall and my friend you know worked at Eagle Leather at the time and took me and um you know was sort of like my safe person you know he was like really Mm -hmm. like looking after me that night he was like, you know, come with me. Like, I'm, I'm going to look after you. And I'm just like, oh, you, you, I love you, babe. Like, you're just so great. And his name was Brent. And and Brent was like, come, let's go up the front. Let's go up the front. And went, oh, I'm a bit scared. You know, if I stand up the front, like, everyone's going to see me and go like, ooh, like, well, Simone has got a new look on tonight. Uh, so I was like shitting myself because I didn't want the same response that I'd gotten, you know, like so many years before. And it was mm. – um, and like – Brent just turns around to me and just goes, I just want to say that I'm I'm so proud of you and there's no one else I would rather be standing next to tonight. And I just went, oh, you just are the most beautiful man. <laughs> like that just oh, makes wow. me feel so fucking safe, right? Here's a person that knew what to do, that knew what to say, and it was like the first person in my life who actually like just made me feel safe in public and made me feel good and safe about my transness. And then I had this sick time watching Hate hate Rock. And so like that, I guess, just like really started, I think, my personal connection with, with the Buffalo Cub Club that eventually became Hugs, but also like this was like, I'm ready to do this. Fuck you, Melbourne. Simona's like, is here finally, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I guess that was my first, yeah, first connection with, with the venue. So pretty magical first first night then. <laughs> yeah, what, I couldn't um, see a fucking thing because the, cause the hate rock just play in, in dry ice and, um, you know, in, in smoke, which I love, you know, and, and I just couldn't see a bloody thing. But um, so I, I shouldn't have been so worried that people are able to see me. But, um, yeah, no, it was it was great. So so you saw hate rock and then you started going back to the venue. What was it about the place that made you want to go back? It just booked really edgy stuff. Like, you know, it just had really good bands and it had, you know, good DJs. And it was just when, I guess, like the Melbourne music scene was starting to transition, I think, back. You know, it was, it was, 2010s were very much like a band scene that was like pretty straight or like mm. queerness was really sort of like under the radar. And, you know, the club scene was pretty, pretty awesome, but it was like all the, awesome clubs were closing down. So like Honky Tonks was another amazing, amazing club in the 2010s and that had closed down. It had turned into like a couple of different things. And then, so Melbourne was just being gentrified, you know, really significantly. We were losing our, not only our clubs, but we were losing these 24 hour licenses. And so the, going back to the license, so the significance of this license was that it didn't have to have a lot of security. It only needed to have one security guard there the whole night, whereas, like, every other club had to have, like, one security guard per 80 people or whatever. 
So places were just like crawling with security and those security guards like weren't safe for queer people, let alone for trans people. And mm-hmm. it was really difficult to run queer nights because we had these turkeys on the door who were just like, like literally telling people like, don't come in here, it's gay night. Like, you know, <gasps> like I, I, I ran a party at this club and, um, and that was what they were telling people on the door. Don't come in here. It's gay night. And I was just like, fuck that, you know. What, so not even like a, oh, just so you know, this is a gay night. They were actually like turning people away. Or just just convincing people not to turn up, you know, because I'd have Shit. like my people on the door and they'd come down mm-hmm. and be like, hey, just so you know, like old mate upstairs has just like sent away like 10 people who wanted to come in. <sighs> Um, yeah, I mean, and maybe they didn't want to come in because it was gay night, but also like maybe don't have that conversation. It's why is that even relevant? Maybe like yeah, get yeah. them to come downstairs and like have a good time because we're playing good music and we're all sick people, you know, like we're, and we're having a great time. So, you know, it was like that I'm was sick the in this of, instance is a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah, sick. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, we're all sick cunts, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> So like uh so that that would be sort of like I guess the climate that was sort of around the sort of 2012 2013 I think and um H- Buffalo Club turned into hugs around about you know this this time and um hugs became this little haven and it just so happened that queer and trans people were emerging as these creators of um, club spaces, of, you know, of of dance music, where DJs were bands that took over this largely sort of cishet band scene that had preceded them in the 2010s and it was our mm-hmm. time. And so places like Hugs and Kisses became, you know, a place where we did feel safe, where we did feel like we belonged and where we did feel that like the management and the security were going to back us. So like it was in the context of clubbing, like a relatively safe place. Mm -hmm. It wasn't completely safe because no place is safe. You know, it wasn't accessible in terms of it was like two two flights upstairs, you know, so like, you know, it wasn't an accessible space. It was a very makeshift, you know, like infill loft, you know, architectural typology, if you like, or sort of club club space in that sense. Yeah, but it had like <laughs> this lounge that <laughs> we just smoked in the whole time, you know, and you weren't allowed to smoke in clubs. So we just got away <sighs> with anything we wanted, you know. It was just really loose. <laughs> Can we talk more about then what like facilitated that change in the scene? Uh, well, I think there just became a critical mass of trans and gender diverse people um, that were emerging into their 20s, um, into their 30s, and we just wanted a place to go. And, the, and this was, the, you know, we, you know, we were having really great house parties. Like it was just a really like a heaving community, you know, 20-year-olds, mm-hmm. 18-year-olds, um, you know, um, and people in their 30s who, you know, I guess like, you know, millennials that were creating their own spaces that weren't connected to that and they wanted something of their own. Um, and so like when I was running this party, Shock of the New, and then some of these people started to turn up and I was like, oh, this is cool, you know, and and so then I ran mm-hmm. some of these parties at places like um, Gasometer or at Liberty Social and, you um, yeah, it's like there was like the last party that I did at Liberty Social was like heaving and, you know, it was like, I'm like, yay, this is, this is great. I'm, I'm running a, a, a really awesome like transgender diverse club here and I'm playing like awesome techno. Um, and, um, but we weren't selling any money at the bar because everyone was in the laneway drinking goon, um, and, and, <laughs> and, and on pingers and, and, and so wait, like, okay, wait, 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 goon and pingers explain. Yeah. Or, 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 or <laughs> goon is like really cheap shit cask wine. And, and so you just like rip it, rip it yeah. out of the cardboard box and you just put it in your bag and you just like, you just fill up your bottle with it and, and you just drink it outside in the gutter and smoke. 
Um, and ping or ping is just you know everyone's on pills. Oh, okay. So you know you, you didn't even have to pay the the entry fee. You could just sit in the gutter all night. <laughs> like the gutter is like the third space. You know, like Melbourne has this like sick Langway culture. But what it means ostensibly is like if you're at a club, it means you don't actually have to go into the club. You can just like spend the whole fucking night by the bins <laughs> or like in the gutter. Oh, the and glamour. like and the whole night is like there's at least 60 people out there the whole night and the only time anyone moves is when the garbage truck comes or when the cops come. <laughs> so that would happen but, but it, it meant that like sometimes like clubs were like, sorry, like we're going to have to close because we're not selling enough beer and we're just like, oh, fuck, you know, like everyone's having a sick one. Uh, so Hugs ended up um, wearing that. Hugs didn't care. Hugs, like Hugo didn't give a shit how much money he was making on the bar. All he wanted to do was like, be awesome and we mm -hmm. did too and so like the business model of it didn't have to operate in the same way that like lounge or bony or anything else had to because it didn't have to pay like a fuck ton of security guards for a start <laughs> But mm. also, like you know, it was it, it was a free for all, you know. So, um, so and, and we and we love that we we love that um, that freedom, and, and it, it's 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 just suited us. But also, you know, they were like when when cis people came in and fucked up in there, they weren't allowed back in, and cis people did come in and fuck up, and they did take liberties, and they did take up space and they did abuse privileges and they did assault people and they did stuff that they would have got away with in the 2000s that they could they cannot get away with anymore and so it almost just kind of like made those people like yeah take a back seat which was really good because I'd been existing in Melbourne in club spaces you know basically like having to put up with these people you know, and I couldn't be out at these places. Like I'd be trying to, trying to come out at places like John or at, um, you know, or at Trough, and, you know, and people coming up to me and saying like really cook shit to me like, oh, you probably shouldn't come out as trans because like you're being, fe being feminine. It would just take away from your art. And I'm just kind of like, excuse me, or like say shit to me like you actually look better as a, as a man than you do as a woman. And I'm just like, ah, oh, like honestly, like this is really not the, the kind of environment that is going to actually like sustain any trans people, right? So yeah. by creating our own, you know, kind of clubs and having our own autonomy within these spaces, we were able to create spaces that other people could come in and 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 have their own trans awakenings. So like music becomes this site of transing. It becomes this site of trans spatial production in that sense um, where like people just emerge into the people that they want to be. And it, it just it just blossomed. Like it just exploded. Oh, amazing. Like, and, so that, and, so that, and so you had you had hugs, but, you know, the alternative was that if we went to places like Lounge or we went to places like Boney, we would literally like there would be like 15, 16 of us and we'd all wait until we all got to the laneway. And then once we were all in the laneway and we were all a little bit cooked and then when we would be like, okay, cool, trans takeover, we're going in, and we'd literally <laughs> all walk in up the stairs all all 15 of us at once and they couldn't stop us and we walked straight to the front of the dance floor and we pushed all of the cishets back and we occupied the front of that dance floor and we made those clubs go off. Like it was like we made those places memorable until they closed. So they were the most amazing times. <laughs> Can we talk quickly about the um, people who were compromising the space or not respecting the space? And I'm not trying to be pro security guard here, but you know, in other kinds of bars and pubs, if that happened, the security would be able to help. How was that managed and facilitated by the people in that space at the time? Uh, I mean, there's sort of this irony, I guess, in the fact that there wasn't many security guards, um, that there was like one security guard and the fact that like things, you know, seemed, you know, perhaps a little bit more manageable just with one security guard compared to places that had four or five. But clubs, this became a really big part of, I guess, the discourse um, around 
you know, we wanted we wanted queer and trans people, and we wanted trans people of color. We wanted um, like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and First Nations queers to feel safe, and we, I mean that meant that we all had to do something about it ourselves because we couldn't rely on the system to do that. We couldn't rely on you know the the owners and managers to do that. Um, you know who are you know sort of like largely you know not queer. Um, largely mm-hmm. white, largely cis. Um, so we had to sort of like figure that stuff out ourselves. And, you know, so there was there were like safer space policies that were sort of like part of Facebook groups. There were phone numbers that people could ring. There were, you know, like party angels and all that sort of stuff. And What does a party angel do? Oh, like, you know, like a party angel is like someone who's like, you, know, you can call this number if you're in trouble, you know, and they'll come and find you in the club and, you know, and just, and do some help. I don't know. I mean, that was sort of like one alternative for, um, you know, for a, a club that, that used to exist as well. But, um, mm. but, but specifically talking about uh, hugs and kisses, they were a little bit sort of like, oh, we don't want to have rules here. Mm. And we, we were a bit, yeah, but like there's stuff happening that we don't want to have happen and they're like, we'll deal with it. And they did deal with it, you know, like like they, they did deal with it. Like there was something that happened to me and that got dealt with. So, you know, I, I guess there was a certain amount of trust um, that they, they built. But, yeah, it was, it, but it was often compromised as well. Like there was, it, like there was stuff that went down that, that, that was sort of like, oh, there's going to be an accountability process on Monday morning, you know. And um, like I said, you know, if, if <laughs> before, like with the whole cancel culture thing, you know, so you know, it, it was it, it it certainly like had its issues, like trying to toe mm, that line, I mm. guess. See, I quite like rules. <laughs> I like I like the idea of the lawlessness or the like anything goes here. There are no rules, but then like in practice, it just gets a bit difficult doesn't it well there's common courtesy you know it's kind of like common courtesy isn't sort of like rules per se you know like but some people need to be reminded yeah and so i guess like like there were a few uh, like the incidents that happened early on in the piece i think set that tone that were like if Mm -hmm. you're gonna do stuff like this you're you're gonna be banned and so people did get banned and that got around and so, and 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 it did get around that like this space prioritizes, and and so when so when parties were being advertised, like those rules were on the party invites, and it was and like you know it was like this place prioritizes, you know trans and queer people, this place prioritizes trans people of color, or this this party prioritizes, um, you know trans first tra- trans and queer first nations people um so you know when that's on the you, you know that that's you know what what you're in for and so that just generally became you know the rule of thumb that when you went to hugs and kisses that 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 was that was part of the condition of entry it was not to be a dickhead yeah there's lots of people who don't think they're being dickheads though that's the only thing yeah, well, I, there was a few. There was a few people that learnt the hard way. I can tell you that right now. And, but but I think that like you know we like I wasn't gonna the way that I there were ways that I was treated. Say for instance at the Builders Arms in ninety seven, that I wasn't going to be treated like that again, in mm-hmm. two thousand and fifteen, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like yeah. I wasn't gonna have some cis guy reach out and grab my tits because they were like, wow, you know, uh, I wasn't gonna have. Um, you know, like a, a, a whole lot of other things happen and neither were anyone else, you know. And and I think that that has, you know, brought forward into like a, you know, just a bit more of a respectful environment around the ways that people party um, mm. and the way that particularly trans and, and gender diverse bodies are, um, uh, you know, like respected. Mm. And that's been really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hugely important. Um, and so, correct me if I'm wrong, the building was sold and so the writing was on the wall for the club night uh, at some point, like, like six months before it actually closed. Do you remember hearing about that? Yeah, so I think like we knew about six months before Um 
I was doing a residency over Christmas and New Year, like a four-week residency once a week. Um, and, you know, I think that's around about the time when I found out, I think. And um, so um, we all just like poured in there, but we couldn't believe it was true. Um, but, look, it wasn't before we had, you know, we had like a good, you know, between 2014 and 2018, like we had a pretty solid four years of we gave that place a good hoon. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we, that place, um, yeah, like, um, yeah, we, we, so by the time we got to that last six months, I guess there were so many people that was just like trying to get in and like all different kinds of parties, like, you know, really big, like 24 hour, you know, day and a half parties, like all weekend kind of parties and stuff. Um, so we were just trying to, I guess, like use that, use that license while we had it. Ring <laughs> all the like. value out of it. Yeah. 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 Cause we knew that we were about to lose lounge at the same time, you see. So we were like, oh shit, we're going to lose kisses. We're going to lose hugs and we're going to lose lounge. And I'm like, well, then what? We're like, oh my God, you know, and we just lost, lost Merck across, you know, which that, that turned into a, you know, that's now it's now an apartment building. Surprise, surprise. Um, so it just, it was sort of like the best of the last four years of, or the last eight years of hugs and kisses just got booked in advance and, you know, we just went to every single bit of it that we possibly could and I was just stoked mm. to be able to DJ at some of those final parties. <laughs> I was just like, mm. yeah, it's like this is, you know, this is I'm so lucky. Um, this is what I've, you know, this was, yeah, when I was staring at the at the horizon, you know, from Geelong and, and Mount Eliza all those years ago as a kid, I, that was the little twinkle on the, you know, on the skyline that, that I was looking for, to be honest. You know, it was it was a little dark and dirty recess, like place like hugs. <laughs> you know, a dank little corner to call your own. So, do you remember then the the very very final night? Yes. Yeah, Tell the final morning, it. and I just didn't want to leave. I had separation anxiety. <laughs> I think I was mm. the last person, one of the last people to walk out. It was like me and and my friend Chrissy Matriarchy. She was like, babe, we've just got to go. And I went, yeah, I guess so. Where's, <laughs> where's kick-ons? And it's like you've missed kick-ons because everyone else has gone to kick-ons. And, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, I should just go home really. Um, <laughs> so, it, yeah, it was amazing. And and I remember the very last set Female Wizard played and um, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. In, in terms of like a DJ set that I saw in Melbourne, like it was um, the place just, you know, I mean, I don't know how many times Hugs and Kisses went sideways, but that place just went sideways backwards and forwards for at least like an hour and a half. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, like mid-set, Female Wizard decides to, you know, jump up on the DJ console and go-go dance to their own stuff, you know, and just like pressed against the ceiling you know, with their, with, I can just see their trainers and their fingers, you know, and like that <laughs> half dressed, um, you know, and just like having a having a time to like one of their own tracks, <laughs> and um, you know, and then just like jumping back down and and keep going, you know, and the whole place was just going sick. So, yeah, incredibly memorable, incredible scenes, as they say. <laughs> mm. And then, so now, so it's been closed for a number of years now. Yeah. And when you think back to the club and when you think back to the experiences that you had there, what did that club teach you about yourself? Um, uh, that I'm glad I lived, that I'm glad I'm su- I survived. You know, I just felt every, every, second that I spent in there I um like sucked it in like it was um well you know not like my last time but 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 I just you know I fought so hard for it you know because Mm. I didn't think that I'd realized myself 
um, as a trans person, let alone as a DJ, let alone as a musician, or let alone was I going to be able to find trans community or find a tra- like a musical community or be able to find that in this city. And I just found a lot of pride, I think, in um, the the people that made that happen and um, like a lot of love and um, yeah, like it's a place that's um, always going to be really, really important to me because um, yeah, I think I just learned from it that I don't know, like your wildest dreams can come true. Do you have any memories of hugs and kisses or memories from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, please get in touch. I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories. Go to lostspacespodcast.com and find the section Share a Lost Space and tell me what you got up to. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Lost Spaces Pod. Find out more about Simona at her website, simonacastricum.com, and on Instagram. Her handle is Simona Castricum. Handy. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I have been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there and will be releasing songs over the coming year. You can hear the first single, Well Groom Boys, which is also playing underneath my talking right now, on all streaming platforms. If you like this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on your podcast platform, or just told people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Gay Anderson, and you have been listening.